When World War I began, all sides expected a swift and decisive victory through rapid and open battles with cavalry and infantry charges. No one could have imagined the destructive power of new weapons, especially artillery and machine guns, which had never been tested on such a large scale. Consequently, no one could foresee the number of casualties, and even worse, the nature and brutality of the wounds inflicted. Surplus rifle and machine gun bullets various artillery shells, and then poisonous gases and chemical weapons, bombs, bayonets, trench weapons, and even flamethrowers. All these delivered horrific wounds to soldiers in staggering numbers. This forced the medical field into a state of panic, scrambling to find solutions for their treatment. When the warring sides clashed in the first battles of the war, the destructive power of the new weapons was immediately recognized. The sides rapidly began digging into the ground in front of each other, as otherwise casualties would be so high they would quickly completely run out of troops to fight. Thus began trench warfare, one of the most brutal and horrifying forms of combat the world would ever see. It might sound strange, but these very trenches would be part of the greatest problem for wounded soldiers, the infection. This was a time roughly 20 years before the advent of antibiotics. Being wounded in muddy, filthy trenches dug into agricultural land that had been fertilized for years created a horrific combination for all the unfortunate wounded soldiers and the doctors trying to save their lives. Of course, these circumstances would later be further complicated by the emergence of increasingly devastating weapons such as chemical weapons and even more powerful artillery, but we will come to that later. So, let's start from the beginning. Why were so many people wounded in such brutal ways and unexpected numbers, and why was it so difficult to help them? Based on the experience from the Boer War, which occurred two decades before World War I, the British Army, for example, expected that most wounds would be inflicted by bullets, sabres and bayonets, typical of open combat. Consequently, they prepared for World War I under these assumptions, but they were quickly met with a rude awakening. As weapons had drastically advanced since then, the preparations for caring for the wounded by all the warring sides were, to say the least, inadequate. Although they expected most wounds to be caused by bullets, it would later turn out that two-thirds of casualties were actually from artillery. Additionally, it wasn't considered that when standard rifle or machine gun bullets hit bone, they would completely shatter it into pieces, making it very difficult or impossible to repair and often necessitating amputation of limbs. Since artillery was responsible for the majority of casualties, let's start there and then we'll get progressively more disturbing. High explosive fragmentation, so-called splinter shells, inflicted catastrophic partial or complete dismemberment and mutilation injuries. The sheer force of the explosion would cause a mix of tearing and crushing injuries, where flesh was shredded and bones were shattered into splinters. If that wasn't enough, crush and asphyxiation injuries became common as trenches and dugouts collapsed onto their occupants under heavy and prolonged shelling and often crushing or burring soldiers alive. During an explosion near an unfortunate soldier, the detonation would literally inject pieces of metal, wood and mud into the wound, mixing them with damaged and dead tissue and creating a nightmare for soldier and doctors who had to treat them. Abdominal wounds were also particularly horrifying, creating a gruesome sight. Furthermore, a shell didn't even need to hit a soldier directly with shrapnel because the sheer impact and blast wave could cause ruptures of internal organs and massive internal bleeding, killing the soldier from the inside without any visible external wounds. But as we said at the beginning, the big problem came from the trenches themselves. Dug into agricultural land that had been fertilized for years, this soil was rich in organic material and harbored numerous bacteria, including Clostridium tetani, responsible for tetanus. Then called lockjaw, tetanus is a particularly brutal disease that affects the nervous system, leading to painful muscle contractions and spasms, eventually causing death by asphyxiation. However, this was quickly realized. An anti-serum was given to soldiers with wounds heavily contaminated with dirt. Death or injury from artillery might not have been as terrifying compared to the new weapon 
that soldiers in the trenches would encounter. On April 22, 1915, everything changed when chemical weapons were used for the first time. Once their effectiveness was realized, the development and mass use of chemical weapons by all sides began immediately. Eventually, even one-third of artillery shells contained gas. Chlorine, phosgene and mustard gas were the three main and most used, each with disturbingly brutal effects on unfortunate soldiers. Let's quickly cover their effects. Chlorine gas. When inhaled, chlorine gas reacts with the water in the lungs to form hydrochloric acid, which horribly burns the lungs. Soldiers would feel intense burning and irritation in their eyes, throat and nose, immediately coughing and sensing suffocation. Their burned lungs would then fill with fluid, making breathing impossible, and they would literally drown on dry land. Imagine watching your comrades in such a state and wondering if you were next, questioning whether your mask was properly sealed and functional. Mustard gas. Mustard gas was notorious for its delayed effects. Soldiers often did not realize they had been exposed until hours later, by which time it was most likely too late. It causes severe blistering of the skin and soldiers would develop painful, large blisters on their bodies. Eyes would swell shut, and respiratory tract damage would lead to relentless coughing and internal bleeding. The sight of mustard gas injuries was horrifying. Phosgene gas. Phosgene gas was even more deadly than chlorine. Soldiers might experience only mild irritation initially, but within 24 hours, the real horror would begin. Phosgene causes the proteins in the alveoli of the lungs to break down, leading to massive fluid buildup in the lungs. Affected soldiers would feel their chests tighten and experience a desperate inability to breathe, as though they were drowning from within. Severe chest pain and gradual suffocation would follow. About all the medical services could do for chlorine and phosgene gas victims was to put patients on bed rest and hope that severe symptoms didn't emerge. Mustard gas was another story. The casualty had to be stripped and completely washed. The eyes had to be washed out thoroughly to avoid late damage. Soldiers who survived gas attacks were mostly permanently affected for the rest of their lives, either in the form of scars or respiratory problems. When it comes to open wounds, the absence of antibiotics posed a significant challenge in treating them. Instead, antiseptics were crucial in the fight against infection. Medical personnel used antiseptics like iodine and carbolic acid to wash and disinfect these wounds, trying to remove foreign materials and kill bacteria, reducing the risk of infection. Despite these efforts, gangrene was a common and deadly threat. Gangrene occurs when a wound becomes infected, leading to the death of tissue on a live soldier. The lack of antibiotics meant that once an infection set in, it could spread rapidly, causing severe pain, swelling and discoloration of the affected area. The infected tissue would emit a foul odour, and without quick and effective treatment, the infection could lead to sepsis and death. The primary solution to gangrene was often drastic, amputation. To prevent the spread of infection to the rest of the body, doctors would remove the affected limb. Sometimes a strange but effective technique was used. Sterile maggots were inserted into the wound. They would then consume dead and infected tissue, cleaning the wound and preventing the spread of infection. The maggots ate only dead tissue and were completely safe for the wound. Fortunately, during World War I, anaesthetic chloroform and powerful painkillers like morphine were generally available in sufficient quantities. However, some armies often struggled with shortages, like the French. Soldiers wounded in such conditions sometimes waited days during transport before receiving any form of pain relief. Of course, there were also the inevitable bullet wounds. High-velocity bullets caused horrific damage if they struck bone, 
and often resulted in life-altering injuries if the wound was survivable. Amputation was often the only solution to such messy wounds. On the other hand, bayonet and other melee weapon wounds were quite rare but extremely deadly because such close and personal combat was usually fought to the end. Now we must address another dark topic in its own unique way. Self-inflicted wounds. Yes, you heard correctly. This was such a common occurrence in the trenches of World War I that it even had its own name and was sometimes even punishable by death. In the unbearable conditions of the trenches and under intolerable mental pressure, some soldiers would do anything just to get away. Many would stick their arms or legs out of the trench to be shot by the enemy, or even shoot or injure themselves. They were hoping to receive a so-called blighty wound. This referred to a wound serious enough to send a soldier away from the front or even completely discharge him from the army, but not so dangerous as to severely alter his life after the war. For example, losing one or two fingers on the left hand would be a blighty wound, guaranteeing a return home and exemption from further mobilization while still allowing the soldier to live his life relatively normally. Medical personnel were trained to recognize such wounds, such as powder burns or scorch marks around a bullet wound, indicating it was fired at point-blank range. Many soldiers were sentenced and punished for this, and some were even sentenced to death as it was considered cowardice and betrayal of their country. These soldiers were just humans like us, simply trying to save their lives from a senseless, brutal war they probably didn't fully understand, but were forced to participate in. Of course, we must also mention another disturbing impact of the war on the human psyche. Although not an open wound, shell shock drastically and permanently changed the lives of many soldiers exposed to extreme stress and fear under brutal conditions. Soldiers who experienced the terrible artillery barrages sometimes developed a neuropsychiatric syndrome known by various names, but most commonly as shell shock. It consisted of an array of symptoms like uncontrollable trembling, headache, tinnitus, dizziness, inability to concentrate, memory loss, confusion, and sleep disorders. Some patients could barely walk, suffered partial paralysis, stammered uncontrollably or were unable to speak. Although this is essentially what we today call PTSD, the constant trauma to the brain caused by prolonged artillery barrages left some soldiers with severe lifelong consequences, 